Good evening and welcome to the Wakefield School Committee meeting of Tuesday, October 29th. Uh, as we always start our meetings, we'd like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of, of the United, United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, our mission statement is the, the vision of the Wakefield Public Schools is to graduate students who are confident lifelong learners, who are respectful and caring members of their community. Our mission is to prepare students for college and career and community by providing rich and challenging curriculum, high quality instruction, and educational experiences that meet their individual needs and interests. Uh, item four in our agenda is uh, any public comments. Anybody from the public who wishes to speak? Just for hi. the record, your name. So. Oh, yep. So, hi, my name is Kathy Cristiano, and this is my colleague, uh, Marie Powell. We are Wakefield Education Association building reps for the Walton Elementary School. Tonight, we would like to thank you for approving a 0.5 adjustment counselor at the Walton School for this school year. We appreciate your acknowledgement of the importance of having a school adjustment counselor who can support us in the social and emotional needs of our identified students. Is it, it is a huge positive for us this year, and again, we thank you. We'd, we would also like to thank you for approving a full-time reading specialist for our building. This is another area where students continue to need support across all grade levels. Prior to this school year, a part-time reading specialist was limited to working in kindergarten through grade two classrooms only. By having a full-time member on our staff, all grade levels are now receiving the necessary support in reading. We would like to emphasize to you the importance of having support staff in specific areas to target students that are not on IEPs. As you know, teaching has changed dramatically in the last 10 years, and the classroom, teacher, and classroom teachers are expected to differentiate instruction across all six subject areas, which <coughs> is an overwhelming task. With the help of qualified support staff, we are able to better meet the needs of students in our classroom. We would like to thank you for listening to us, and we hope that as you begin to discuss next year's budget, you will consider keeping our school adjustment counselor position, continue to maintain a full-time reading specialist, and rehire a qualified interventionist. We know and understand how impactful these positions can be to a population of students that can only get their needs met outside of an IEP. This population of students cannot be forgotten. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to speak? Okay, then our Student Advisory Council, please. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, so now that it's October, it's coming a close to fall and heading towards winter. Um, that means that a lot of different sports teams have qualified for their state tournaments probably a lot more than last year, which is a really good sign. A lot of hard work going into that. Um, in the school building, there's um, a lot of like people showing up tired and just like it's becoming a routine now that we're back in school that everyone's kind of just drenched in schoolwork. And it's just, I don't know, it's kind of helpful to have like a social emotional counselor this year, I'm not sure how much use there is so far, but I think it would be helpful to kind of push, like, going to that person to talk as the seniors are applying for colleges and everything like that is going on. There's a lot going on and everybody should feel cared for. Um, I think that things are going, like, pretty well. There haven't been like really school-wide issues or like assemblies called for any bad reason. Um, yeah, I think it's to be expected how it's going pretty much so far. Do you have any suggestions about what might prompt the kids to take that, you know, that stress relief? Um, I feel like having more like time in between classes, it's only four minutes, which you can get anywhere in the building, but 
just a couple minutes, if you could just go in five minutes and talk and you wouldn't have to have a teacher tell you, oh, you're late to your next class and you wouldn't have to miss out on notes and different activities you might be doing. Like just more time for the students to feel like cared for in the building would be better. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, would the social emotional um, support, um, can you tell us how you, um, well, you may know about it because of your role at the school, yeah. but how does the general student population, how are they made aware about support like that? We, we know about guidance and this and that, but Not that's... really. It's not really pushed too much. I mean, I know about it because I'm on different organizations right. that, but um, like my friends probably have no idea that this is available and they did try to push announcements for seniors especially like now that college applications are coming up um, but there is no real like understanding among everyone that it's just okay to go to guidance it's kind of like oh only if you're so like at a point where you really need help but like mm -hmm. just having a bad day like there's no it's an open door, right? What? It's a it's supposed to be an open door, really. Yeah. Like, it's not just for students who may have an IEP or like you yeah. said, an extreme situation. Yeah, no, it's not like as which is sad that it's not um like encouraged enough from everyone. Understood. That's information we certainly can take. Very, yeah. Yeah, Tom. So so you want us to help try and push the word out there for you yeah, to ask. I think there needs to be more because I've never even met the social emotional counselor like I've heard who she is but I've never met her and I don't like know and not knowing a face not being able to put a name to a face not knowing anything about her at all um, it doesn't really encourage you to go and yeah, talk to someone. It would make it difficult know. for someone to yeah. feel they can trust her and go talk to her. Yeah. And Logan, you're on the youth action team, right? Yeah. So it, it seems like at the very least she should be pretty well known to you guys yeah. because you might be a resource that another student would come to to say, hey, I need some help. You know that that person exists so you could push somebody to go yeah. see her, but it would be nice for you to have a relationship with her yeah. to be able to say like, hey, I've met her. She's she's cool, you should go, you should go yeah. spend some time with her. And like, I know she's new and probably busy and everything, but like still yeah. just getting public outreach about it would be helpful. Go ahead. Logan, do you know where Mrs. Burns' office is? No. It's in the history, history wing on the third floor? It is? Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. no idea. Yeah. We just, it's we right just go from Ms. class Lopezer. to class every day and you don't notice anything. Yeah. Even with clubs trying to hang like posters up in the hallway yeah. and get out positive like you don't notice you're just so focused on going here going here going here there's no like school interaction yeah i can tell you that her um students are starting to attend steadily and are starting to drop in a little bit more um so and I'm, we're anticipating in the coming weeks that that will increase as well especially with the end of the first quarter yeah. Then with the end of the first quarter and grades closing, you know, that, that raises a whole other level of um, kind of stress, if you will, in regard to what kids need to, might need to make up or what they might be missing and how they're managing all of that. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you that her um, number, the number of students that are attending and dropping in there is increasing. It's like if you build it, they'll come. So, but I, I think yeah. I wanted to let you know we appreciate the feedback. And I'll talk with Miss McLeod about it in the morning. Okay, that's helpful. Mm. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, was, it, was like, it wasn't on right anyway. <laughs> okay. So moving on to our consent agenda, we have a motion, please. Move that the school committee approve the minutes of the October 15, 2019 school committee meeting as presented. Second. Okay, motion's made and seconded. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Okay. And uh, superintendent's remarks. So I'm gonna s skip down to, to B. Um, in, our last, in our last meeting, we talked a little bit about late start um, and learning from other communities. 
And I think we had an exchange um, in, in some, as well as some curiosity about um, when's the best time to kind of discuss late start and, and the high school schedule. And, and I think that um, based on where we are in negotiations, I think what we're going to do is we're going to table that until we complete negotiations um, as so that we don't kind of mix, mix our lines there or mix our messages. Um, I don't know if there's any questions on that. No, that's fine. That's okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so next up, I'd like to uh, welcome um, our team that's presenting tonight on the MCAS data that has come in for 2019. I'd like to welcome Kara Morrow, Lindsay Mosca, Val Drynan, and Jen Thomas to the table to talk about our MCAS data for um, this past spring. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So I'll start just to point out um, who is accompanying me tonight on this important presentation. So we have Jennifer Thomas, who is our 5 through 12 science curriculum coordinator. Valerie Drynan is our elementary STEM curriculum coordinator. And Lindsay Mosca is our 5 through 12 math curriculum coordinator. So I, I'm so thrilled to have them with me here tonight. The curriculum coordinator role is, is very critical to the district. Um, we're starting to expand this team um, throughout the district. Uh, at this point, we have uh, five at the secondary level, and Valerie is our first curriculum coordinator at the elementary level. And these roles are so important because not only are they content experts, but they're also key to inform our teachers on uh, and support our teachers on best instructional practices. And what I love about where we are with the, the secondary level right now is that they can see the clear trajectory from five through 12, and they can see that through line of um, what is happening in curriculum instruction across all levels. So. Um, all three of these women have, have worked closely with our MCAS data since it's been released and worked closely with teachers in small groups, at department meetings, and through professional development. So they have a lot to offer to the discussion tonight. So as I said, this is an important presentation because it's a lot of information to go through. Um, I think that you know we could go on and on about all the different components of MCAS and what different parts mean. I think, you know, as an administrative team, we look at this as important information. Um, it's not the only data point that we look at, but it is important information that can help continuously um, pro provide growth within our district. So that's the way that we're looking at this. And wherever we have, um, the way we've broken down the presentation is into the following ca categories. We're going to start by looking overall at the district accountability, and then we'll look at achievement results our student growth percentiles, our comparison to our state, to state and our neighbors. We thought that that was an important point. Um, I think that's come up a lot, you know, in terms of different curiosity of how we're, we're comparing to our neighbors in Middlesex County. And then we're also going to compare um, to our DART districts, which we'll get into later, the, um, the groups that DESE has identified, identified as comparable districts for us. And then we'll also be talking about focus areas and action steps for moving forward, how we're using this data to inform where we're going as a district. I would ask, the way that we structured the presentation, as I said, there, there's a lot of information to review and we've broken it up into chunks. We thought it might be best to just go through the presentation as the information builds from slide to slide and then hold questions for the end if that works for all of you. If you have anything that is pressing, feel free to jump in um, or make note of the slide where you have a, a, a question and we can certainly go back at the end. Does that work for everyone? I don't want to. That's fine. All right. <laughs> Micromanage the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we'll just jump right into this next slide, which this is really to provide us with some information as we're going through the information. So each year, DESE sets, um, each year annually, DESE sets improvement targets for every district and school. And those are based on um, different categories. And up at the top shows how the, um, how DESE assigns points to each of those categories. And you can see on the table above, if a, if a district or a school has declined in one of the categories, they're awarded a zero. Uh, no change is a one, improved but didn't meet target is a two, met their target a three, and exceeded target is a four. And then with that percentage of points towards targets, schools are broken down into two categories. One where uh, school uh, districts are requiring assistance from the state and the others where um, they are not requiring any assistance or intervention. About 85% of schools in the, in the state do not require assistance or intervention. So 
so this slide here is a breakdown of our district as a whole. Uh, we, we took a look at each of the schools who are participating in MCAS, grades three, three through 12, and we broke down the percentage of, of points that each of the schools are getting. As you can see from a quick overview here, a positive right off the bat is that none of our schools are requiring assistance or intervention, and all schools are making moderate to substantial progress towards targets. I talked about the categories where points are awarded. Um, the, the way that um, the different categories that districts are awarded points to are, um, we're looking at the achievement, student achievement in ELA, math, and science. We're looking at student growth in ELA and math. We're not measuring uh, growth in science because uh, students aren't testing consecutive years. We're also looking at progress towards English language proficiency. So we're looking at our uh, English learner population, looking at their access scores, and seeing how they're making progress towards proficiency in English. And we're also looking at chronic absenteeism. So chronic absenteeism is looking at the number of absences um, our students are having. We're looking at about 10% of the school year. So students who have 18 or more um, days absent from school. And we'll talk a little bit more about the breakdown of points. I think one thing that um, did stand out to all of us is just um, all of our schools getting a zero um, for points in chronic absenteeism. And that's not to say that we had a major, a drastic um, absenteeism issue occur, but last year in comparison, we were awarded threes or fours. So it's pretty easy to um, decline or, or not change in that area. So um, that might jump out to you on the next page. We also, when we look at the high school, we're also looking at advanced coursework and high school completion. So points awarded for that as well. Kara, I'm not gonna be able to not ask questions. No, that's okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I was gonna try, I'll try no. very hard. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so were each of the schools given goals and then these are the possible points towards those goals? Yeah. So each school and district receives um, targets uh, okay. that they're to achieve based on the results of the previous year. From the previous year, yeah. So the, in, this, in this chart here, the, um, the two leftmost columns, where it's percentage of possible points, are the 2019 points that were awarded to each of those individual schools. And then the progress towards improvement targets is um, the state's way of looking at um, accountability in terms of assistance or intervention over two years. And so the 2018 um, points earned is weighted 40 percent and the 2019 is weighted 60 and so that's that third column um, that the state uses to determine um, uh, progress towards targets and uh, assistance or not over a two-year time span um, sort of in their effort to alleviate some of the um, cohort shifts or sort of unique situations in a certain school or school, school that performs really high and then has declines in some categories and so they average it weighted over two years thank you yep. So now the next slide, if you can see, I know it's jammed pretty tightly on the page. So this is an overall, um, this is an overview of our entire district. And as you can see, the breakdown on the, f on the far left are the categories that I just uh, spoke about in terms of our accountability uh, categories. And you'll see on the far left, that's a breakdown of our um, non-high school students. When, they use the when the term non-high school is used, that means students in grades three through eight. It breaks out all students as well as the lowest performing. And then over to the right are all of our high school students um, who, are, who are tested in, in grade nine and 10. So the lowest performing are also on the far right. So if you look, um, if you can kind of scan, the, I, I won't hit, um, hit on all of the points, but if you scan and you see basically where there's a one, that means that there was no change in terms of um, how, how Wakefield did as a district from last year. And you can see, see an example of that is in math and science achievement. If you see a two, um, that would indicate that we improved but, but did not meet target. You can scan the categories there. An example of that is ELA and math um, growth for non-high school students. Where you see a three, this would mean we met the target set by the state, um, but which would um, highlight high school math achievement and growth and three through eight ELA achievement. And then where you see a four, this would be where we have exceeded the state's target. For example, high school science achievement, ELA, um, high school growth and achievement, and math, lowest performing student achieve achievement. And any dash is a non-reporting category. Are there any questions on it? Just keep going. Okay. Okay, this
this um, this next figure just shows you a highlight of each of the schools here in the district and we wanted to report out here a celebration in the data for each of the schools so there is data at each school that we really do want to um, highlight um, I want to point out that when we're looking at this a good trajectory for our schools is high achievement and high growth and you're able to see that in some of this data um, so some subgroups and some categories and cohorts of students did have high growth and achievement. Um, if you look specifically at Dole Bear and Greenwood, there's an increase in achievement and growth in grade four math. Um, and as you see there, there's something to celebrate in each school, though not just those two. Um, the high school had a really good year, so we want to um, focus in on uh, the high school achievement, and you'll see that in the accountability data on the next slide. So this looks very similar to what you just saw for the district data, but this is just the high school data. Um, so the high school is a collective work of all of our um, students over 12 years. Um, so we see great success here in this uh, cohort here of students. Um, the high school has a lot to celebrate. Um, the red circles there are indicating um, where the high school has either continued to exceed expectation, met or improved um, in those circled categories. Um, so you can see there's quite a few circled categories. Um, it's especially notable is that they are meeting 91% of the points for our lowest performing students in their accountability data. Can you say a little bit more about that? What does that mean? You know, in terms of the meeting the needs of our lowest performing students. So we earned points, if you want a look at achievement, um, the points earned for four were exceeding our targets. So the state set targets for our lowest performing students and we were able to exceed those targets. Uh, if you look at achievement, we exceeded those in ELA, math, and in science. So, I, so four out of the six categories, we exceeded, substantially exceeded expectations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the other two we improved. Correct. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, we're gonna shift a little bit now from accountability to student achievement. And this is just an overview of the two types of tests that were given in the spring of 2019. So the next generation test is the newer MCAS test, which our students um, in grades three to eight took for math, ELA, and science. Um, they also took this um, for our math and ELA at the high school level. And so those categories are exceeding expectations, meeting expectations, partially meeting and not meeting. So we'll be talking about those categories. Um, the high school science test was still the legacy MCAS. Um, so that is the older test. They will take the next generation for the first time this spring. And those reporting categories are slightly different. It's advanced, proficient, needs improvement, and uh, warning. And those numbers are scoring. So if you're a parent at home and you're looking at this, the next um, generation score goes from a 220 to a 280, so that's probably what you've been familiar with. Sorry, the le legacy score is the 220 to the 280. The next gen is scored from a 440 to a 560. Okay, this um, represents our science achievement um, compared to the state. So the top graphic is our grade five, and you can see on the left hand side is Wakefield and on the right hand side is our state um, a measure of proficiency in the standards is a sum of the two top categories exceeding and meeting uh, in grades five our meeting and exceeding was 53 percent which is five percent higher than the state um, in grade eight we were also oh, um, higher than the state in our exceeding and meeting categories and that is the uh, bottom graphic and again Wakefield is on the left and the state is on the right um, important to note here is that grade eight is our first cohort of students who have been taught the new standards in grade six, seven, and eight. Um, and then I guess just one other thing is we really can't compare that data to the prior year because that was the first year of that test. Uh, this graphic looks a little bit different. Um, because this is the legacy data. So this is the last year of uh, the science MCAS at the high school. Uh, in blue, you will see the district data. In red is the state data. Um, you'll see that a, the advanced and proficient, so different naming for the categories, or our proficiency level for students was 84% um, in Wakefield, which is 10% higher than the state. 
And this also represents a 9% increase um, from the 2018 data. And again, this will be the uh, last time that this test is given, so we'll have new um, MCAS data in the spring. And I, one thing I just wanted to point out here is we do notice in this data that there is a need for us to be shifting our students from proficient to advanced. Let's look at that. Jen, can I ask you know, yeah. a, a question that comes up when we talk about science is that with such a focus on science, you know, I think in the past couple of years, there's been a question about when can, when can we expect gains, mm -hmm. right? And do, do you attribute the gains at the high school to the curriculum work that's been done or, or is, there, is it more than that? I think we're, we're shifting our focus to be more standards focused and aligning our curriculum amongst our teachers so it's more of a team approach. Um, so we're ensuring equity that all our students are receiving the same content and standards. So I would say that was definitely a shift towards our improvement. It's nice. It's good improvement. Yeah. 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 Definitely something to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, as as much as I'm very proud that we have a table here of math and science experts that are all women, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'm going to put on my ELA hat here for a minute um, just because I do a lot with data um, and pinch it for ELA data. So um, I'm going to talk about um, a little bit more details about math, uh, or excuse me, uh, ELA in math um, achievement. And so this is a similar graphic to what we saw for science for grades three to eight ELA. Um, and then also for ELA grade 10, these graphics, um, if you want something that's a little bit more clear, and if the public wants to see something that's more clear, is available publicly on the state profiles page um, by school, and you can click on the different grade levels and see these graphics really clearly. So most of this information we're presenting is available from the DESE website in case people can't see this well or have uh, questions about the details. And so for grades three to eight, again, Wakefield's on the left and the state is on the right. And in ELA, um, our meets plus exceeds category, so our measure of proficiency for students with standards is um, three percentage points above the state. And we have um, a good chunk of students uh, less than the state that are not meeting expectations. And so many more of our students are meeting uh, the expectations for their grade level in ELA grades three to eight. Um, and then in grade 10, um, there's some really nice numbers here where we have um, a really big uh, spread between um, students in, that we have exceeding expectations versus the state um, and also meeting plus exceeding um, is a significant amount higher um, in ELA. It's a 70 versus 61 percent of our students which is uh, something to celebrate. Um, very few of our students in grade 10 are not meeting expectations for ELA um, which I think is a big accomplishment for the high school uh, as well with this data. And so if you switch to the, the next slide, um, this is a breakdown that we're going to be showing um, for a number of different things for both ELA and math achievement as well as their student growth percentile. So I'll take a minute to tell you what this uh, graphic is showing. Um, so in black, those are the 2018 results. And then in red is the 2019 results. We can do a year to year comparison because these students have um, in grades three to eight have taken the next generation MCAS more than uh, one year in a row. Um, and then also uh, the number to the left is uh, the district results and in parentheses is the state results. And so just as an example, um, if you look at um, grade five um, results for all students, and so we go to grade five results for all students, the 53-54 in black means that last year 53% of our students met or exceeded expectations and the state percentage was 54. And then this year in red, you see 54% of our students met or exceeded expectations in grade five ELA, and 52% was the number for the state. And so there were some gains there, um, both in just the percentage of students um, meeting or exceeding expectations, but also in comparison to the state for those results. Um, another interesting way to look at uh, this data is you can actually see cohorts over two years if you look at it diagonally. So for instance, from grade seven into grade eight, if you look at um, the black number 47 to the 49 in grade eight, that is the same cohort of students taking MCAS. And then also in our high needs category, there was a really big jump uh, in achievement for those students. And so previously in um, 2018, it was 11% of our students were meeting or exceeding expectations in the high needs category versus 20% uh, this year, which is a, a big gain in that cohort. Um, the high needs category is a combination of um, socioeconomic disadvantaged students, um, ELs, and uh, students with disabilities. And so those students get double counted in a lot of ways, but the um, state identifies that as an interesting group of uh, students for schools to focus on. A lot of finances go into that group of students as well. 
Um, in grade 10 ELA, we have just the 2019 data because their previous scores in 2018 were the legacy MCATs are not comparable. And so the numbers uh, looking at them side by side is really confusing. And so we just put the 20. Uh, 19 results there, but um, you can kind of see how we've done compared to the state in the breakdown in each category there. So. All right, so this is the math data. Again, very similar um, graphics to what we had in ELA. Um, in grades three to eight, uh, overall as a district, we had 52% uh, of our students uh, were meeting or exceeding expectations um, versus 49% in the state. Uh, and then we had only 7% of our students not meeting expectations, um, up to 12% uh, compared with the state. And so um, what I think is really interesting in this data is that as you move from the grades three to eight district summary into grade 10, we have even fewer students not meeting expectations um, and more in the exceeds category. So students are moving in the right direction as they sort of culminate their uh, Wakefield Public Schools experience in uh, mathematics, uh, which is exciting. Um, and then also, you know, in the grade 10, um, the students had a, a really great performance. 69% um, of our students meet or exceed expectations versus 58% uh, in the state. And so then this is the same graphic that, uh, that we had for the ELA. Um, just, uh, you know, one spot to, to look at in terms of, you know, revisiting what the, the setup is. In, in grade three, the high needs students, um, in 2018, 24% of those students uh, we're meeting or exceeding expectations, and this year was 31% of them. So it was a big jump. Um, you know, I think uh, across the board, something that is, is interesting to the, the whole team is that we have work to do with our high need students uh, to help them to be uh, proficient in their grade level standards. Um, and I think that, you know, we're on the, a good path with, with good people to make that work happen. Um, it's nice to see the improvements, but we have a ways to go. Uh, the, again, the cohorting, there was a, you know, a nice place to celebrate by looking at the grade five moving into grade six cohort this year. Um, we can see they've, they really improved in 2018. It was 38% uh, meeting expectations all the way up to 47. Um, and then the high new students was 16 to 28%. And so there's been some big gains in, um, and that's the same group of kids uh, moving from one grade to the other, which is, is nice to see. Um, and then there's the breakdown for uh, grade 10 math for uh, 2019 only. Um, so in the next couple of slides, um, I'm going to highlight how we are performing here in Wakefield uh, in comparison to both our DART districts and our neighboring districts. So um, just a little background uh, as far as what DART uh, stands for, District Analysis and Review, review, to review mm -hmm. Tools, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this is a snapshot of comparable districts that the state has identified um, as a a way to use this to focus on areas of, find areas of inquiry and focus in the data that we can look at to improve and celebrate. Um, so the state selects these comparable districts based on a framework of educational organizations, which includes um, demographic data, assessment, student support, staffing, financial assistance, and achievement gap data. And this can include, but is not limited to, demographics, um, including enrollment, ELs, stability, attendance and discipline, and um, MCAS and English proficiency. So that's just how they choose these districts that um, were compared to. And it's also important to note in this chart that we pulled the 2018 DART districts with the 2019 data, knowing that the DART districts are pretty um, consistent from year to year, but they have not yet released this year's DART district. Those are released in December. So we base this on those districts, but with this current year's data. Um, so we're using this as one piece of data to frame our work going forward. Um, and as we transition to the next slide, we're going to put it into a graph form here so it's a little bit easier to um, understand. Uh -oh. These are not good. <laughs> They're not going to float in on us. Oh, um, <laughs> the bottom line it was, was supposed to float in. But All right, so our lines <laughs> we were supposed to float in so we could go one at a time here. But I'll just talk about each one separately. So the first bar at the top there with the green um, shows our um, grade 10 uh, science data or high school science data the number of students um, in advanced or proficient. So that, as you remember, Jen's probably saying that um, is what is considered proficient. Uh, proficiency for the science test in high school. So as you can see, we're in the top half of the DART districts there. Um, 
And then the next bar that you look at there, the second bar, shows our students meter, meeting or exceeding, so the ones that are considered proficient in grades three through eight math. Um, so as you can see, overall, we're not quite meeting the mark in comparison to our DART districts there, and this was helpful to us in determining math as an area of focus um, in the grades three through eight, which we're gonna discuss later in our presentation in our action steps. Um, and so while the state uses this thoughtful algorithm to find comparable districts, we also know that people are always very curious about the people nearby, right? The other districts that are closer to us and are more familiar to us. So we did um, also pull the district data from um, districts in closer proximity. And what you'll notice when we go to the graph on this one, um, same thing here, when you look at the science um, high school data, you'll see we're you know, we're in the upper end, not quite as um, high, and but we are still showing strengths in that data. And same with the three through eight math, we're still showing areas of growth um, in that data. So it's pretty consistent in both um, as far as that goes. Um, the next thing we're gonna shift into talking about is SGP, student growth percentiles. Um, so just a little bit about those. You can see here there's five different measures for the student growth percentiles, going from very low growth to exceeding typical growth. Um, for example, if you're you know, scoring an SGP of 60 or higher, you're exceeding the typical growth. There's a breakdown of typical high, typical low, and then one to 29.9 would be very low. Um, so just to give a little background on that, um, it is important to know that growth is, is a comparable measure from year to year because the, stu the way that growth is measured is over a two year period, um, students are grouped with other students who are scoring in a similar achievement um, category as them. So if somebody was scoring a 470, for example, in 2018, they're gonna be grouped with the other students that scored that 470 range in 2018 and then compared the next year for their growth score. So it's comparable to how they performed over two years. Um, so when we do go to the next slide and look at the growth, you'll notice there is no SGP for grade three because there's only one year of data. So um, that's an important uh, piece of information to know. Um, so on our next slide, um, this is similar to the slide that um, Lindsay presented earlier. We set it up the same way for consistency. So 2018 is in black, 2019 in red. Uh, the state is in parentheses. Um, and you can see, um, for example, some celebrations in the SGP data for ELA from grades six to seven. When you follow that cohort, um, it increases from 47.3 to 57.4, and also in the high needs category as well. Um, and same with math in grades six to seven. So that was a, a nice celebration for that cohort of students. Um, and it also is important to note that um, the SGP is normed for all students. So you'll notice that the, in the state, the SGP is 50 all the way across because that is how they norm um, the SGP for all students. Let's see, I think that, I yeah, that. I think mm -hmm. we got that. Okay. So the next slide <clears throat> that I'll move into, we'll talk a bit about how we're going to support, support our areas of growth, what we've done in the past year, how we're, we're moving forward this year. Before I move into that, do we want to break for any questions related to the data slides that we just presented? I'm happy to do that if, if you'd like. If you have any specific, if you want, me, want us to go back or elaborate on anything. It just seems, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but it, it almost feels like if you were scoring very well, it hurts you the next year because it's hard to grow from a good number. Well, I, go ahead. Yeah, I, so, so, I'm gonna so, I'm, I can go down so to that. So, in, in terms of accountability, that can be especially true for small schools and for small districts like Wakefield. And so, um, in terms of accountability, when you score very well and you exceed expectations um, of the state's targets and you exceed those targets, um, what that means is you had um, a, a really great standout year in a lot of categories. You exceed their expectations, and then the growth targets that they set for you the next year are very high. Mm -hmm. um, and so, any decline in progress from the previous year automatically assigns a zero. And so in a school like Walton, who in 2018 had extremely high numbers, um, they were over 90% in their accountability reporting, um, 
ends up getting some pretty low scores the next year when anything from um, a cohort, unique situations with the educational environment, or just it wasn't quite as standout as a year, any decline produces lots of zeros in the reporting, which mm -hmm. is part of why the district averages it weighted 40, 60 over two years, and so they're still at moderate progress towards their targets in terms of accountability. In the one-year picture, it looks really harsh, but it's because it's a measure of growth compared to um, targets set from a really high bar. And in small schools, in small districts, they're especially susceptible um, to those four to zero issues, for sure. So it seems to me like we need to be certain that we do a really good job communicating that before the public goes into this panic. Yes, so I, I think that's why yeah, we brought it yeah, back to this slide, yeah, because I think yeah. Walton will jump out uh, on the page, but it's important to know how high they were um, how high they ranked last year as a school Which distinction, I remember that. and their that's targets right, yeah. being mm -hmm. as high as they were. That mm -hmm. it's yeah. So the uh, yeah, there's still a level one school. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's, so that's, that's I think we we need to be sure to communicate that. Right. I think their, their targets were just that much higher, and as we said, even with like I, I referenced earlier, the chronic absenteeism absenteeism all of our schools got zero points for that this year it doesn't mean that we have this drastic absenteeism absenteeism problem we're de certainly looking into it and we're pulling all of our students who have 18 or more um, absences and trying to figure out the story behind that and how we can get kids to school more um, but it's because the the year before all of our schools got three threes or four so it's easy to decline or have no change um, I think in terms of like achievement data with the what you're talking about um, mr. chairman is that also, with the achievement data, that's partially why we showed data from grades three to eight as a district rather than individually by school, because it's important for us to look at overall progress as a district by grade level, because when you have small schools, um, and you're looking at that, cohorts can be a really big swing impact in those small populations, and to look at progress as a district, it's more helpful to look at it across all those grade levels together. Take away that competition, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I just had a question. Um, back to the sort of setting those goals, are the goals always set on only the previous year or do they look back a couple of years, you know? So looking at Walton again, they had that, you know, the, the super year there. The year before, you know, maybe their numbers were in the 70s, right. their percent, but are they not looking at that in terms of growth, that they're, they're setting goals based on only the previous year? It's a great question. I don't know exactly if they're only looking at the previous year, but I know that they're fundamentally looking for growth year to year to year. Right. And so regardless, right. of, so wherever you've gotten, they don't want to see a decline in progress. Of course. Right. Um, and so that's really but the that, that the third column goes. is an a, is yeah. an average of over two years time. Mm -hmm. The the third column. Of right. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that gives you a clearer picture of it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? No? Okay. Just skip back ahead. Okay. All right, so just moving on to this next slide. This is um, where we wanted to highlight the work that we've done over the past, um, the year last year, and then what we, we've continued into um, the 1920 school year. And I've talked a lot about a lot of these things at previous meetings, um, but I think it, it's important to note that MCAS results from last year really drove the conversations in terms of where are we as a district and where do we need to go. Um, it was a starting off point for us. It wasn't the be all end all, but I think a lot of the work um, that we did last year, um, I was new, um, Doug was coming in the first year as superintendent. Um, we had some new curriculum coordinators, new administrators. I think what we were finding was that we needed to ask a lot of questions around um, where we were in terms of our MCAS scores and where we wanted to be. And I think a lot of the conversation stemmed around looking around the district and looking at all of the resources that we have, the great systems, the great teaching. Um, why is it that our scores aren't, you know, as a whole matching what, what, we, what we're seeing in the district for all the great things that are happening? So that, that question of why um, was, was one that I took with me. Um, and I think we've had um, those conversations in a lot of different um, settings with administrators, instructional leaders. And I think we found as a common trend throughout the district that we needed to um, spend more time structuring conversations around um, standards-based practices. <laughs> and what I mean by that is we, we talked earlier about MCAS being an assessment of standards. Um, Mass Massachusetts um, has set standards for learning in all content areas, all grade levels. And what that means is we 
we've um, the state has identified um, skills and competencies that we want our students to know and understand from year to year. So I think what we discovered is that we have spent a lot of time um, decide, determining that we need to be consistent across the elementary level, uh, horizontally and vertically, um, and we've invested a lot in curriculum aligned <coughs> resources, which has been fabulous, but we, the work can't stop there. We need to keep going. We need to spend more time unpacking this, the standards and identifying which standards are, uh, take top priority in terms of um, coming to agreements around what are the standards that our students absolutely have to know and understand before moving on to the next grade level. And those skills will build on each other, on, on our students from year to year to year. So we identified that as a pretty consistent goal across the district, um, and that was, that was huge for us to, to make that determination. So following that, um, we did um, do, as we looked at our instructional leadership team as a whole, and we looked at um, our job descriptions of our instructional leaders, we looked at our curriculum coordinators, our depart department coordinators, curriculum liaisons, and um, really looked at, at what are the roles and responsibilities of, those, <coughs> of, of that group and how can they be curriculum leaders across the district. And uh, we, are, we then provided professional development for that group to make sure that um, we were all on the same page, working towards a common goal, and that everyone understood where we needed to go. Kara, can I, I just yeah. interrupt you for a second? Can you just share a little bit with the committee and for anyone that might be watching at home the um, difference between the content standards and the practice standards? Yep. So I, I don't want to take a, I feel oh. like you guys are expert. <laughs> I don't want to do a disservice. <laughs> um, so in each of the content areas, it's slightly different, but in science, um, they when they came out with the new standards, they blended them together. So there's a skill and a content right. standard that's associated with them. So for example, in science, you might um, have to come up with the claim, evidence, and reasoning behind um, some information and text. And that's associated with, um, let's say, cell theory. So there's two pieces. So we're not only just developing content knowledge for our students, but the skill that they can use to approach any problem in science. Um, it's a little bit different in math, um, sure. if you want to speak to that. Yeah, sure. So in, um, in math, uh, from K to 12, the standards are broken up um, in content by either grade level or domain. And then um, the Common Core has in, that's been adopted in Massachusetts has adopted eight mathematical practice standards that apply to every year. And so those practice standards include things like reasoning and sense making, um, problem solving skills, modeling, uh, attention to precision, and sort of um, all the things about what's important in math class that kids transfer to all content areas. And so, um, you know, really the skills part of each content area, including ELA in, in world language um, in social studies, are the transferable skills that students take away from a content area. So, you know, uh, no teacher says the most important thing I'm doing in my class is solving a quadratic equation, right? Is that kids can reason, they can problem solve, they can make sense, and they can apply those skills to complicated problems in other parts of their life. And so that's really the theme of the mm -hmm. difference between those two things. And I just want to add that a lot of our PD time in district um, over the past year has been spent getting teachers more comfortable with those skills. So how do we teach those skills? Um, because the, you know most of the content teachers are very familiar with their content standards, but there's been a shift in focus to mm -hmm. the skills um, across the state. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. And then just, I'll just point out a couple of other um, important points from last year. I think last year we also decided um, that it was just imperative that we continue the work of curriculum mapping. Um, I think with the with the adoption of curriculum resources, those resources tend to have a map associated with them, but we felt that it was important to do the work of unpacking the standards with, in Wakefield, looking at um, the standards and making sure that our resources were aligned. Um, there, most programs aren't perfectly aligned. We might need to sh play around with the scope and sequence. So we took to um, creating teacher working groups throughout the summer led by the curriculum coordinators to create um, stage one of uh, the curriculum maps in all of our content areas last, last summer. Um, we also, again, determined the importance of the curriculum coordinator role and established the STEM curriculum coordinator at the elementary level. Mm -hmm. I think looking ahead, um, <laughs> looking ahead, we're <laughs> wanting to cover all of our content areas and we, I would have an eye on, on looking at a humanities coordinator in the future as well just to, to again look at that consistency piece and that oversight um, to ensure equity across all of our schools. 
And then in terms of instructional shifts, I think we're always talking about um, you know, how do we get our students more engaged? How do we um, get our students to take more ownership of their learning? Um, how do they understand, uh, are they understanding um, what they're supposed to be, why they're learning that, how are they demonstrating their understanding? So I think that a lot of the work that the curriculum coordinators um, are doing is moving in that direction. Um, just as, I was, yeah, yeah, was going to say, just a, a quick tie-in is sort of like a lot of the things we're talking about, about standards-based instruction um, in getting more of this transferable skill work um, understood and done well in the classroom is directly related to um, how MCAS assesses. It's not a test that you can practice the test and do better. Um, it's not, it's, it, you know, for, for better or worse, however people feel about it, it is an assessment that is incorporating reasoning and sense-making and higher-order skills for our students. Um, and so aligning those things and incorporating that into our classroom practices um, really does help improve achievement overall for students. Um, it's not the style of assessment that practicing the test makes us better. So. Absolutely. And um, just to add on to the um, curriculum mapping for the elementary, I was fortunate enough to have mm -hmm. some time earlier, like already early this year, um, meeting with the K-2 to teams and then in the three to fours and PLCs. Um, to share some uh, summer math project curriculum mapping that I was fortunate to be a part of as well um, to start some of this work at the elementary school as well. So I know a lot was done last year in the secondary and we've started the laying the foundation for going forward with that in the elementary as well. So just to, write, just to add on to the summer math project, um, so I, ha I haven't um, talked about this at, at other meetings, but I thought that was just so uh, important for our district to be a part of last summer. We collaborated with five other districts and a math consultant, all of whom are, are using the Envisions program, and we looked, um, we looked across the board. We, we targeted uh, K through five, and we looked at how we're using the Envisions program and what are the lessons that are really meeting the mark for our students and where are those um, that require some supplemental resources or um, activities and we also um, the maps also include a, um, progress monitoring um, assessments as well so that was a nice uh, tool for Val to have coming in yes. for sure <laughs> to, to reference so then and just in terms of uh, we just looked at this section as just staying the course I think last year was a lot of information gathering and trying to figure out where do we need to go? We worked a lot at our retreat this summer with the other uh, administrators within the district to make sure that we all were in agreement uh, in terms of, of where we need to go as a district. And so we, you know, as Val has said, the work she's doing focusing on K through four math, while she is a STEM curriculum coordinator, it's not that science is taking a back seat at all. Um, Jennifer Thomas last year led a, a teacher group, um, a, a teacher, a science teacher group last year to help roll out the new FOSS um, science program at the elementary level. And you know, with that came prioritizing standards, looking at scope and sequence. Um, so we're continuing on with that work, but we, we, we need to take things one step at a time. And we felt that based on you know, where we are in terms of our MCAS scores, as well as um, the, the place we are in terms of our curriculum review cycle, we are in phase five at this point where we're analyzing our materials and looking at um, you know, how things are working for us and making tweaks as necessary. So that just made sense. We're consistently using and revising our curriculum maps. Um, those aren't just check off done. They're constantly referenced within um, teacher working groups, um, our PLCs, our professional learning communities. We're talking about student data and student work. Um, we've also talked about, um, just to stay on the curriculum map, uh, the, cur the coordinators all feel prepared in all of their content areas to move into stage two of the curriculum maps where they've identified already the uh, desired results, what they want, you know, all of our, what they want the big takeaways to be uh, in each content area and they're feeling ready to move on to the assessment, um, evidence, assessment and evidence portion of those maps this year. Um, just another key point on this, we talk about benchmarking practices at the elementary level. So a big undertaking for us last year was looking, um, we had done basically an overhaul of, of the data that we were using in the district and wanting to make sure that the data we were getting for our students throughout the school year came close to aligning with what we were seeing for results in M on MCAS. And I think we were finding from talking to different, um, to smaller different groups, we weren't always seeing that. There wasn't always the consistency in what we were getting for results um, on our uh, reading benchmark or uh, math. We felt like we were falling short in just overall in terms of data to progress monitor our students. So we made a couple of decisions last year that are um, carried out into this year. Uh, last year we, made, we did a full upgrade of our Fontes and Pinnell benchmark assessment system at the elementary level for all of our teachers, K through four. And we also this year, we rolled that out 
and set new expectations around benchmarking our students. We've, we've uh, made an elementary-wide decision that we'll be benchmarking all of our students three times a year to continue to m monitor them. Even if they met grade level expectations, we'll be continuing to benchmark to ensure um, continuous growth. We also um, brought in iReady as a diagnostic tool for the elementary level. This was something that was piloted at Galvin, and um, they've taken on the instructional component in grade um, in, at Galvin as well. Um, but at the elementary level, we piloted the instructional and diagnostic in grades three and four. We piloted it with a group of teachers last year. We got really positive results, and we felt like it was a good, um, it could be a good indicator for us as we progress monitor students in, in math. And it also just creates a consistent flow as students transition up to, <coughs> to Galvin. Is that part of the IPASS? No, it's a separate program. Yeah, it's a separate just program. Just all cleverly stealing the I. I know, the I, <laughs> yeah. The I is in front of everything now. <coughs> and then last, I'll just say, you know, we're, we're always talking about um, coaching cycles. So our, our curriculum coordinators all have a coaching component with their jobs. We have literacy coaches at the uh, elementary level as well. We're just continuously talking about what this looks like and how to create a culture of growth for all of our, our, our educators. Anybody want to add anything to that? that cover that is great. Okay. And this is a slide that you, you know presented to you before, but I just think it's so important to talk about how we're creating a through line, how we're um, just as a district coming together. And it all does start with the district instructional strategy, which I, I've linked up there. Uh, the, the, ma the major goal that we have as a district right now in terms of standards-based practices is pulled right from the instructional strategy, from the rich and challenging curricular, curriculum section of that, where we talk about the need to implement consistent, high-quality, standards-aligned al curriculum in all areas. So that right there was a huge driver for us um, as we analyzed what, whether or not this was happening um, in all of our, our areas and whether or not we spent the time to really make sure um, that this is happening from grade level to grade level. And I was thrilled this year. I think we, we spent a lot of time on our school improvement plans at um, each of the schools, and we created a common academic <coughs> goal across the district where we're, we're focusing in on ensuring that our students understand the what, why, and how. What, what are they learning? Why are they learning it? And how can they demonstrate, th demonstrate their understanding of that learning? So that really just ties right into the standards-based practice goal. And then the next section of that upside down triangle, you'll see teacher um, PPGs, which means prof professional practice goals, and then student learning goals. So each of our teachers uh, each year creates a professional practice and a student learning goal. And it has been encouraged that, that these goals tie into the school improvement <coughs> goals um, for, for the buildings in which they work. And a lot of our teachers have, have gone this route and um, created goals that are aligned to, to what we're, we're targeting in our school improvement plan, which will just I think make the work move that much faster. And then at the bottom is our classroom practices, hoping to see all of this play out in our classrooms for our students. So this next section just highlights what our focus is for professional development for this year. I've, I already presented to you on our professional development structure, but I just thought it was important for you to see this goal that was agreed upon by all of our administrators and um, our instructional leaders. So the goal that was created district-wide is that um, ideally over the next couple of years, we want to move at a pace that's reasonable, but we would like all of our educators to understand the st standards for the grade level and content area that they teach, understand the criteria for student mastery of prioritized standards, align lessons to grade level standards by way of the curriculum maps, utilize curriculum materials and supplement as needed, and develop and administrator, Im, administer common assessments. So this was, this was something that was agreed upon um, throughout the district, and the work of the curriculum coordinators um, plays a big part in making this happen. And as I talked about the five content professional development days that we have structured for the year, they're, um, they're all focused around this goal and chunking it out into reasonable parts. Um, we've had two content professional development um, sessions this year. The first one focused on continuing to identify priority standards, and then the second one focused on um, high quality learning objectives, and, and what does that look like in a classroom? Feel free to jump in. I mean, you, yeah, I was just the say, coordinators I, ran that PD, so I think I'm they have a lot to offer here, with that. But Jennifer tells me that this is the first time <laughs> we've had such a clear alignment between the mm -hmm. five subject areas for our content PD. I don't know if you wanted to speak to that. Shift. Yeah, I would say that, that um, you know, our five 
through 12 coordinators, the five of us have worked collaboratively as our own PLC um, to develop a uh, common message and common activities that we would do during this PD so that all of our staff are receiving um, the same message and uh, the same instructional strategies so that we are all aligned with the district goals. And I also take part in that PLC now. Sorry, just so, no, no, no. I just did it to, show, to throw this in there, um, just so, so that way we can see. Like I was saying to you earlier, we're looking forward to doing this at the elementary level. So it's nice to be included with them and know what has happened already, what is happening now, so we can kind of plan out the trajectory for how that can look in the elementary grades. So. And I want to just add too that this is just not happening at just these five sessions. Um, so we're constantly, you know, offering to coach teachers on particular areas that they might be struggling with, like how to write really good um, learning objectives for the particular um, lesson that you're coming with. And so we can support them in that way as well. All right. And then we'll, just, we'll open it up to any questions that anyone has. Really? I have comments, not oh. necessarily questions. Okay. Is it okay? <laughs> um, so thanks to all of you. It's nice to have kind of a full crew um, of knowledgeable people who clearly are very in touch with the data. Um, I think um, for me, having I've been looking at this data since it's been made kind of available, and um, it is overwhelming, and it's hard to get your arms around, and it's hard to figure out how to interpret it. Um, and I think it's very easy to go down kind of rat holes of why is this cohort the way that it looks and um, and I think you guys have done a nice job of kind of packaging the data um, I think for me personally again having looked at the data pretty significantly the accountability ratings and the what the zeros mean were incredibly important to me because mm -hmm. I actually missed that fact mm -hmm. and I was trying to get my head around yeah. how did we end up in this situation right mm -hmm. and a zero is just that we declined year over year right. um, which isn't good but isn't that you didn't get right. you know at first I was looking at it saying why are we getting zero points out of a scale of four right. like that's awful right. mm -hmm. and it really isn't awful right, right? it's we declined right um, and so I think it what is tough about MCAS data in my perspective is there is so much and you can get lost in it and it is hard to interpret. Um, so I think you guys have done a really nice job of kind of setting the stage of this is what you're looking at. Um, you know, I, I do th have questions myself about specific cohorts. I don't think this is the time nor place yeah. to bring it up. I think, um, I think you've done a nice job talking about how you intend to improve based on data, and I think that's all that I would ask is that um, you're looking at data and building a plan around kind of what you're seeing. Um, so I appreciate kind of all of the work because I know that this is significant work. It's not easy to present for 45 minutes yeah. and um, really, really appreciate the yeah. work you've done. And I, I just want to commend the coordinators because I think they've done a nice job with um, taking the information and presenting it in a way that doesn't overwhelm, because you're right, Susie, you can go down the rabbit hole you can get you can feel overwhelmed you can start to compare the wrong things and I think that they've just done a nice job of presenting this information in in s small groups in PLCs or department meetings and, and talking with teachers about it in an in a non-threatening way and just say like listen we're there's great things happening in this district mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of good but let's use this to you know to figure out how do we continuously grow and just modeling mm -hmm. that idea of continuous growth which we want to <coughs> see for our students as well yeah. um, so I just I think that you all did a nice in our job with in that. our PLCs and teacher meetings, you know, like we um, teachers have been asking real nitty gritty questions. You know, like which of my students got these ones wrong, and what percentage of our kids didn't get this standard. And so we're looking at item analysis and looking at released questions, um, and asking hard questions like why did my class do so well on this, and like what did I do differently than you. And so they're really in the weeds a bit and mm -hmm. using it um, in in a really productive way. Um, and so while this is a bit of an overview. Um, teachers are eyeball deep in it as well, which is right. exciting. We're definitely digging deeper than what we've shown you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll be here for five hours. <laughs> Short. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to clarify the, uh, the 10th grade. So this spring, our 10th graders will be taking a different test. The next generation. For science. science. For science. Just for science. It's actually our grade nine students. So the state reports out it's a grade 10 because some districts test in different grade levels for science. But it's our ninth grade bio students in Wakefield that take the science test. 
and they will be taking a new test this spring, which is based on the new standards for so, the first time. So, our, but our 10th graders that need to pass this test for graduation, it's still the legacy? The, it was, this past year it was the legacy. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you're talking about students who haven't passed yet, they... No, the ones who are going to, to 10th, th come to 10th graders who will take the test this spring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Will be the, the it'll be the, the new test. The new test. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. the first time that's going to happen. Yes. Yep. yep. So Science every is the last right. Yeah. Behind. So everyone mm -hmm. will be now on the next gen test come this spring. Come this spring. There'll be no more legacy. Yep. They've also changed the competency determination, right? Which will will be able to report more in the coming months. Yeah. yeah. There's a, some pretty complicated methodology they use to, for instance, um, ELA in, in math at the high schools. We didn't have the comparable data because they switched to the new test in spring 2019 for those two grade mm -hmm. levels. And what the state w did was they renormed what it meant to get the graduation credential so that it matched the data from previous years so that the new test that was sort of um, a bit more focused in on higher order skills and it held the standard a bit higher did not exclude more students from graduation. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a temporary measure until districts can catch up to the higher standard. I guess what I've noticed in the past is that every time they change this test, scores plummet the first year. <laughs> And it, it, since it's such a high-stakes test, I don't know how the, these 10th graders are protected from that. They change the threshold, yeah. okay. right? They change the threshold to maintain a level of competency so that, you know, the number of students aren't, so that students aren't negatively impacted yeah. um, on their opportunities in regard to their opportunities to graduate high school. Okay. And so and they have a chance in the lower grades to come up to the high standard. Correct. Correct. There's there's still uh, um, something that's really important. There's still a, a disproportion to the number how we do at grades three through eight and how our kids do at the high school. We do mm. considerably better um, based on the from the, the data at the high school level. Yeah. But I think with the new assessment and the new thresholds, that the scores will be similar to grades three through eight. But the competency determination will also ensure that kids are also graduating as well. So it, we will be able to show that graphically, I think, and in, in especially with next year's scores. If I can Go ahead. add, I, I would just like to thank you all for coming and presenting tonight. I so appreciate it. And one of the things that I think I love most about this presentation is how fiercely committed you all are to the data and to, you don't shy away for a second in talking about where we need to improve, um, and, but also all of the good work that the teachers are doing, yeah. right? This is really complex <coughs> work. You know, I think Kara pointed out in the, in the presentation that we need to stay the course. Mm -hmm. We need to keep working the plan. We need to keep you know, working with teachers, um, and we need to kind of take our lead with them and from them to, to, to see where they need help and how we can best support them. You know, I think Kathy pointed out in earlier that you know, teaching elementary, especially grade four, grade three, grade four, is particularly complex. And it, the, the standards, both the practice standards and the content standards for all the content areas the teachers are responsible for at those levels is particularly sophisticated. Um, and and we're, we're gonna get there. Um, and I love the way that you treat this data as a prompt, not as an end point, but a prompt to say this is where we are right now. Um, so I can't thank you enough. Great. There's a, certainly a, a tremendous amount of work went into this presentation. <laughs> I, I can't imagine how many hours you spent. So we thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, for thank you very thank much. You. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, you. Well, I, I just wanted to comment. Um, just while Doug was talking, I was thinking about it, and um, also thank you so much. Um, like Susie said, just to echo what Susie said, I think it's it's so important to just understand and grasp the data, not only for, for us, but for our, our community members, our parents and caretakers, um, you know, who really look to this as a guide and, mm -hmm. you know, just one of the things that shows the work of the system, um, one indicator anyway. But um, I'm, I'm really happy to see in, in the high needs category, because I think that across the board, you know, across all of our instructional strategies, strategies and, and what Kathy was talking about earlier, the support mm -hmm. that is placed there in prior years, but this year, 
and at the high school. Um, I, f I just feel like those numbers are just going to continue to improve mm -hmm. because of our social emotional support, our reading support, mm -hmm. and um, in even seeing the, the increments, you know, now that they're improving is just such great data because you know, that just speaks to the equity Absolutely. and um, that we're improving on that year to year. So and that's really thing exciting for the to see. Community to know is that rising tides lift all boats. And so yeah. when those students do better, all of our students do better. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's great data. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You Thank, Thank you so you. much. Did you get any more? Or you done? That's it for me. That's it for you. Okay. <laughs> That was easy. easy. I know. <laughs> I know. Okay. Uh, under item eight, with chairman's comments, is a couple of things. Uh, just an update again. The uh, the committee will meet on November twelfth in Boston uh, with the with, uh, with the Metco uh, um, meeting. Uh, directions agendas will be sent uh, sent out appropriately. Um, in regards to our retreat. Uh, I have spoken to uh, Dorothy Presser. Um, she's pretty flexible for Saturdays in December. Uh, clearly, I think the earlier the better. I don't know. Uh, I, I would propose December 7th. Do we have any conflicts at the table for that? Any, any Saturday in December, I'm available. Okay, so, okay. I, I spoke to Ann earlier. She was available, so the only one I haven't cleared with is. Tom and Amy, but I'm going to shoot for the seventh. Okay. I'm available. Okay. Um, tri board meeting. Uh, I think that went it went pretty well. Uh, it was it's, it's a it was an unwieldy size uh, group at the table. It was, it was with, with three separate three boards. It was it was. Uh, I think we had a lot of potential for uh, breakdown, and we did very well not to. Um, I, I think it's just important for us to have a, a common understanding of where. The other boards are coming from their, their viewpoints. Um, it, it's easy to get in, just involved in your own little uh, domain and not understand what's going on in the rest of the town. So I think it was very productive, and I, I, I want to thank the other two boards for uh, participating. Uh, wanted to give a big shout out to our marching band. Uh, they, uh, <coughs> you know, had, we host two 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 competitions here in Wakefield, which are always very well attended. Uh, we're very well known for hosting uh, great shows. Uh, then last s Saturday, uh, the band went to uh, Reading, and they scored a, a ninety-five point seven five, which is a platinum medal. Uh, they again, they're 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 breaking all kinds of uh, records for this early in, in the season. Uh, they did get rained out on Sunday for Micah finals. Um, so this Sunday is as the Nespa finals. Uh, Wakefield will be performing at 6:15, uh, and the, the finals are held at uh, Lawrence High School. Uh, it, it's a it's a great place to be. It, it, it's a great show. And if you have time to just uh, go up and see them perform, it, it's 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 a great show. It's, it's a lot of fun to watch. And then uh, moving on to our, uh, we had scheduled the uh, superintendent evaluation, but as uh, the public can see, we uh, had some last minute uh, vacancies uh, at the, our meeting tonight. And I think it's important that everybody uh, has a chance to comment uh, during that process. So I'm uh, suggesting that we move uh, that item to our November 26th uh, meeting when we will be back here in Wakefield. Barring any objections, that's what we shall do. Okay. Uh, moving on to budget items, we have uh, several gifts uh, to uh, on the agenda tonight. Move that the school committee accept with gratitude the following two donations: seven hundred and sixty-six dollars from the Friends of Wakefield High School field hockey, a second stipend to pay the assistant coach for the fall twenty nineteen season, and. $766 from the Friends of Wakefield High School Field Hockey, a third stipend to pay the assistant coach for the fall 2019 season. Move that the school committee accept with gratitude the donation of $4,500. Oh, 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 the second, the, second, the first, second, first motion. Oh, do we have, I'm sorry. They're all separate, so. so second. <laughs> motion remains seconded. <laughs> They're wrapping them all together. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm like that>. <laughs> <laughs> all those in favor. Okay, next one. <laughs> 
Move that the school committee accept with gratitude the donation of $4,500 from the w WHS Girls Soccer stipends for the assistant coaches for the 2019 fall season. Second. Motion is made and seconded. All those in favor? Okay. Move that the school committee accept with gratitude the donation of $1,500 from the Wakefield Alliance Against Violence to pay the stipend for the MVP advisor, Mentor in Violence Protection. Second. Motion is made and seconded. All those in favor? And move that the school committee accept with gratitude the donation of $5,000 from the Walton School PTO for the Walton School Library. Second. Motion is made and seconded. All those in favor? That, that, that's pretty impressive. That's almost $12,000 in gifts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, subcommittee reports. Uh, finance and facilities uh, did meet with the um, uh, FinCon members uh, the last Friday? Yep. Okay. And uh, as I have scheduled a, a, another meeting for November 22nd. Uh, last Friday was really just, uh, there was no votes taken. It was, it was really just a... Uh, kind of a, a setting the tone kind of uh, going forward. So we, we should be a little bit deeper into the weeds in, uh, on, on November 22nd. Um, labor, anything new to report, Colleen? Uh, we continue to meet um, aggressively and uh, you know, working on negotiations and... Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, student services, uh, we were... We were supposed to have a meeting yesterday that we ended up having to cancel, but we are working. We have a draft for our transition survey, and we're working on getting our final product with the hope of sending out the transition survey at the end of the first quarter to the parents, students, and faculty that we'll be surveying. Great. Thank you. And policy and communications. So we met tonight prior to this meeting, and um, we have three uh, policies that we will be bringing to the um, to the full committee the plan is right now on the November 26th meeting we're going to um, forego bringing it to the the committee on the 12th because we've got the MECO meeting um, so we're going to wait and bring that um, bring that to the committee on the 26th those are the um, life-threatening allergy policy um, and then a separated discrimination and harassment policy which is one, and bullying policy, which is another. So the three of those we intend to bring to the committee for consideration, and um, I think we'll be laying them on the table that week and voting on them the following week, or following meeting. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and then I had one other thing. Um, we had been working on our mission um, of, the policy, of the committee, which we um, voted on and approved. We voted on and approved, which I don't think I have to get everybody. Do we, I? I don't know. Do I have to get the whole committee to vote and approve on so. our mission? No. Okay, so I was just going to read it. Okay. Um, and uh, so the mission of the policy and communication subcommittee is to regularly review and update the policies that govern the Wakefield Public Schools students and employees. The policies provide guidance to students, parents, and staff on how to operate in specific situations. The goal of the committee is to keep policies up to date to best support the entire WPS community as needs change over time. When it comes to communication, the mis mission of this committee is to keep families with children in Wayfield Public Schools, as well as community members in general, informed of upcoming meetings and topics and to share the decisions made and materials reviewed at the meetings using both the WPS website and social media. So that is our, that is our committee mission that we okay. have finalized. Okay. And Thank that you. is it. Okay. So uh, we've already done future dates uh, and moved couple of things to agenda items forward. So uh, any school committee comments, Tom? No, I think we're get it covered, huh? Okay. Colleen? Uh, I was just going to report that um, when the tri-board meeting took place on the 17th, I was able to attend the Human Rights Commission human trafficking event. And I was able to listen to, I, got, I arrived a little bit late, but I was able to listen to the, um, the victims story about um you know sort of her life and and tra trajectory that got her into um being a victim of human trafficking and you know personally you can't 
not absorb the information, you know, for, for your children and for your friends and family. But uh, I was really trying to put on um, our, our a hat as a, you know, a school committee member, but also thinking in education uh, for our staff and district. So um, one of the things that, or a couple things that I took away from from that event was that we need to understand that no one is immune to sort of the dangers and the pressures of human trafficking. Um, I think it's okay to say that uh, the, the victim was from a town that is only just a couple towns away from us. And um, if, if appearances mean anything to some people, uh, you, you don't look at you know one victim over another and say, oh, they look like this or they look like that. Um, she looks like, you know, any other mom that I would see coming into the schools to pick up your children. Um, so I think it's really important to to remember that. And then also uh, in education, um, when is it appropriate to start having the conversations ar around human trafficking um, in our health and wellness classes and to um, so that our children understand it, but also feel supported. One of the things that was a common theme was that there's there's a stigma, you know, and so uh, victims are less likely to put trust in uh, administrators, uh, you know, our our fire and police, our our educators, whoever that trusted person may be in their lives. But a lot of them don't have any. But um, you know, as public institutions, that's that's our responsibility, right, to be those trusted individuals. So uh, she was saying that no matter how long it takes for the victim to finally open up and receive the support, you keep offering the support. So I, I was just thinking, you know, from a district standpoint, how, how we and our social emotional support, our guidance support, how we sort of just are always reflective of that this, this can be something that walks through the, their doors, you know, and continue to offer the support and, and the language around it that is not oh, it only happens to this, this subgroup of, of students or this subgroup of students or, you know, that it can, it can happen for many student that's walking in the door. Um, I feel like I'm getting a little bit, it was a very emotional um, event, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe something that we can discuss um, on our student services subcommittee, something that they can tackle down the line um, and see, um, in our curriculum, uh, our health and wellness curriculum, you know, when is it appropriate to to address such a thing? Because um, it is, it's certainly heavy. Um, and you know how we can be supportive in our roles um, as counselors and social workers and whatnot, sort of being prepared for for what may walk in the door, um, someone's story or just uh, the signs that you look for, you know, to support students like that. So. Sounds like one of those things you always think is going to happen to somebody else, but it, not necessarily. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, sort of when you are able to open your mind, you know, and say, hey, this, we need to just be prepared and support our students, um, and we're ready. I always felt like Wakefield is, is unique in that way, that we don't, we don't shy away from the problems that exist. You know, um, we're pretty open to realizing that these problems exist in all of our communities and mm -hmm. we need to prevent that and be ready to support, so. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Susie? No comments from me. Okay. Comments? Yeah, I, I think I would just like to add um, that at our tri-board meeting, I, I'd like to thank um, our WEA president, Will Kevin Harris, to, for his remarks and for the teachers. So for those, um, that weren't able to see the tri-board meeting, um, the WBA president, Will Cavanaris, came and he, he spoke about um, the challenges that the teachers are facing in the classrooms and the changing needs of students and, and all that comes with that. And, and I thought he did a, a really nice job with a limited amount of time to be able to share um, some of the perspectives that the teachers um, think are most critical for the community to know. And, and just debriefing um, with some of our um, FinCom members and our town council members, I, I don't think that his comments um, were missed on them. And, and I just want to thank him and thank 
the teachers um, that numbered, I think, probably around 200 um, who came out in, in solidarity to kind of to be, um, to support his message um, as their message. And so um, I think it's important just to note that I think the, the, the chairs of, of those committees um, did not miss those comments, and I think that they um, appreciated those comments as well. So uh, with that, I would uh, have them entertain a motion to adjourn. Move that the school committee adjourn this meeting of October 29, 2019. Second. Second. All those in favor. <laughs> hey. Thank, Thank you. you and good night.